morning, everybody, and welcome to our uh, another meeting of the Portland Children's Levy Allocation Committee. It's good to see you all. I'm City Commissioner Dan Saltzman, and also the, the chair of the Allocation Committee. And I'd like to introduce my, my fellow uh, committee members. Uh, on my far right is Mitch Horniker, representing the Portland Business Alliance. Next to him is Julie S. Young, who is the city-appointed uh, citizen representative. And on my far left is Serena Stoudemire Wesley. She is the Multnomah County citizen member. And next to me is Multnomah County Commission Chair Marisa Madrigal. Now I'd like to introduce the Portland Children's Levy staff, uh, starting with Director Lisa Pellegrino, who oversees after-school investments. <laughs> Assistant Director Meg McElroy, who is in charge of early childhood and mentoring investments. Lisa Hansel, who supervises the foster care and child abuse prevention and intervention investments. Communications Director Mary Gay Broderick and Fiscal Specialist John Kelly. So we have a, a packed agenda today, uh, but before we dive in, I'll give a short primer on, on the levy, on the children's levy. It was first created by Portland voters in 2002. The children's levy was overwhelmingly renewed in 2008 and most recently overwhelmingly renewed in the spring of, of this year. The levy annually supports approximately $10 million worth of investments through programs in early childhood, after school and mentoring, child abuse prevention and intervention, helping children in foster care succeed, and in this new funding round, we're pleased to begin a new focus area on alleviate, alleviating childhood hunger. The levy operates with a 5% administrative cap and is annually audited by an outside independent firm and, reach, and reaches and serves about 10,000 children and families each year. So first up today is approval of the minutes for our October 29th meeting. I'll entertain a motion to... So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Great, our minutes are approved. So next, we always have an opportunity at the beginning of our meeting if anyone wants to address us on topics in general about the children's levy. Uh, we'll have opportunity also for public comment on our specific agenda items, but if there's anybody uh, that wishes to talk to us on any general children's levy topic, now is, now is your time. I don't see anybody raising their hand or coming forward. Okay, then we will uh, move on to uh, our next agenda item, which is the allocation, the first agenda item, which is our allocation of funds, proposed allocation of funds between the program areas of the children's levy. Morning. Morning. I'm Meg McElroy, Assistant Director with the Children's Levy, and uh, I'm going to um, help you review um, the staff recommendation for allocation between the program areas and why that's a key decision that you all need to make. Um, so the reminder about that decision is that in order to know how much funding we're gonna have available in each program area, uh, we do need to have some guide um, outlined for us to know how to apportion the revenues across those six program areas. So just keep in mind that whatever you decide is really a goal um, and you have some flexibility once applications are in, because if you find that there are more compelling applications in one program area versus another, you may want to think about that um, and be able to um, move things around a little bit in order to accomplish um, goals in another program area. So just keep in mind, th these are not... This decision doesn't necessarily mean you have to absolutely allocate up to that amount. Historically, there were some changes that occurred, but we do need to get a decision on this um, allocation, this allocation apportioning, so that we understand how much funding is available to publish in the request for investments um, in January. So, in <clears throat> revisiting the testimony that we heard last time. Um, one of the greatest sort of pieces of feedback was around um, mentoring and the reductions in mentoring. And 
also in foster care. And one thing I want to point out about staff's recommendation that was provided at the last meeting on the public materials is that we had an error in it. So the allocations that were provided in the um, public meeting last time across the six program areas added up to only 98% while the recommendation we gave you on the materials we gave you in writing added to 100%. So we apologize for the error. Uh, the implication of that error is that we were actually, in the materials provided to the public, it was off by 1% in mentoring. So the staff recommendation was not 10% for mentoring, it was 11%. And it was off by 1% in foster care. Um, so the recommendation was 12% uh, for foster care and not 11%. So the revised, I shouldn't say revised, the accurate staff recommendation in the public materials is provided today on the blue handout, and it's the gray column. And those handouts are also available over here. Yes, on the table as you walked in the door. So if anyone doesn't have one, we'd be happy to provide it for you. Um, so I wanted to point that out to you, um, that error. And then also wanted to point out that we still stand by our staff recommendation. So the, the recommendation that was published today that you all originally saw is still where we stand, even given the testimony that we heard. Um, if you look at sort of the differences between the um, allocations in the past and the recommendation we're providing, the reduction, so to speak, or the changes, I should say, not reductions, the changes for after school child abuse prevention intervention, foster care, and mentoring are roughly the same um, change. Uh, it is only early childhood for which the change is um, much different. Um, the most important point to keep in mind here is that these changes are not reducing, are likely not reducing dollars to any given program area. In the last year, uh, revenue, actual revenue, um, realized exceeded projections by 9%. That trend is likely to continue. On account of that trend, we anticipate that there will be an increase in total dollars for all of the program areas, as well as funding um, hunger relief in and of itself as an additional program area. So despite the changes to the allocation percentages for the program areas, as we've recommended, we do not anticipate that it will result in dollar reductions for a program area. And with that, I would be happy to enter, excuse me, entertain any questions, but also want to open it up for discussion for you all because this topic was um, presented to you last time and then we heard testimony, but you all didn't have a chance to discuss it. Um, so my, our hope today was to offer you that opportunity for discussion um, and then hopefully if we can move toward a, toward a vote if that seems like a doable option today. Okay, thank you. Um, do allocation committee members have any issues they want to raise or questions <coughs> of staff about the proposed allocation amongst the six uh, funding priorities for the children's levy? I guess we don't have any discussion. Wow, so. all right. Um, do you want a short meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to hear any further testimony? Uh, yes, I think we should. Uh, allow opportunity for public testimony. Um, Do you want a show of hands? Yeah, or, I, I should ask, is, is there anybody who wishes to testify about the proposed allocation of funds amongst our six investment areas? Okay, well, I don't oh. see anybody here. Or, <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, I think maybe the why there's no discussion and maybe no testimony, I think we believe that you did a great job both in your uh, community outreach where you asked a lot of people about how to allocate our dollars amongst these funding priorities and uh, I think your your recommendations are reflected in in the both the community input you received but also looking at how we've allocated funds in the past as well and I think you've uh, done well plus adding uh, uh, an allocation for hunger relief so. Great. are we ready to make this formal make this the the cornerstone of our request for investments. Mm -hmm. Happy to entertain a motion to that effect. I move that we accept um, staff recommendations for allocation of funds between program areas. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, it's official.
All right. And just as a footnote to that, we do expect um, uh, and have communicated with the city economist and should have updated revenue figures for the January meeting, which we've now set for January 10th. So by then, we should have some actual dollar figures to give you. Yeah, um, and I thought maybe I should just, for the sake of our viewing audience, read what the percentages will be for each area. So for early childhood, we will be investing 31% of our dollars. Uh, child abuse and prevention intervention, 19% of our dollars. Uh, foster care, 12% of our dollars. After school investments, after school programs, 19%. Mentoring programs, 11%. And hunger relief, 8%. So there we have it. Well, great. So uh, moving on, we're going to revisit an issue we discussed at the last meeting, and that is the allocation of, well, we did the allocation of funds between program areas, so now we're moving on to the strategies. And um, I think you're here to provide us your latest uh, on the strategies, and I know that a couple of us have some proposed uh, amendments we wish to make. Um, before we get into talking about the specific strategies, and I think we will go through program area by program area to discuss them, um, I just want to give just a couple comments overall to keep in mind as we enter this discussion. Um, so the first is that um, staff added, um, made a few small revisions to those strategies from um, from when you last saw them and from when the public last saw them. Um, and one of, uh, we try to meet with everybody, all the allocation committee members before this meeting just to kind of um, provide additional information or uh, clarification. And a couple of people suggested that we um, provide, that the staff make recommendations for allocation of the funds within each strategy area, because we had done that in a couple of strategy areas, but we didn't do it through for all of them. Um, and I thought that was a good recommendation, so we went back um, through that exercise and added that. So that's reflected in the paperwork that you have. The committee may have something in color, so it's highlighted in yellow, but other folks in the audience, I believe it's at least highlighted in gray. Um, so you can see easily what was added. Um, and I, I also wanted to highlight that these, the, trying to set um, allocation, general goals around allocation percentages within those stra within each program area, that that was meant to be a goal. Um, and that in, it, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's a, it's a goal that we're aiming toward. And I think that no matter what, um, there's going to be other factors that impact funding decisions that will not necessarily mean that you hold fast and true to those allocation percentages above all other priorities. So if, you, um, if we don't receive a lot of applications in, or a lot of quality applications in a particular strategy area, and I don't know that staff would recommend that we fund something that we don't think is likely to be successful um, because it, it, we said we were going to spend 30% of our money on that that's that's not that doesn't meet our overall goals of funding proven and effective programs. I mean, there's there's competing goals here. So the concept I want folks to keep in mind is this would be a guideline. This is what we'd be aiming toward, not hard and fast. We must you know reach this percentage or we don't you know fund a program. So so that's just something to keep in mind that these are meant as a guideline and a goal, something to aim toward. The other thing I want people to be clear on, both in the audience and, and for the committee, is that when staff select, within the, each of those strategies, there are priority areas. We say prioritize a population, prioritize a particular type of service, prioritize a geographic area. Those priorities came out of the public input process. That's where they come from. And we asked people in the public input process and certain parts of it to prioritize. If we asked you to tell you where the greatest need is, you tell us where you think the greatest need is. Those are the things that filtered up that's what those priorities reflect. I don't. I wanted to be clear. The staff didn't intend that that meant that that was a requirement. That anybody who applied in that strategy absolutely must meet all of the priorities, or they wouldn't be eligible to apply for funding. A priority is meant to reflect that overall, all of the, overall the investments in that strategy would prioritize certain populations or service. I mean, the priorities themselves are service. Uh, they essentially reflect the priorities for types of services that people said they wanted and needed. So it, again, it's, a, it's meant to reflect that this is what our goal is, but it's not to mean, say that any program that doesn't hit every priority would not be eligible to apply. So that's just something to keep in mind, not a requirement, a goal. And I think that's pretty much it in terms of overall thoughts. I just wanted to make sure that was clear so that we didn't get a lot of testimony um, you know, assuming that, that, this, that what we said was a priority would necessarily be a hard and fast requirement. Okay, so do we want to head into early childhood? We thought we would discuss the strategies in the order in which, and again, the point here is to discuss, and folks I know have amendments or thoughts, and, um, and the idea would be to, if people feel ready to vote, if there isn't a lot of discussion or disagreement or they don't want redrafting, um, then we can vote, or, you know, after taking, uh, hearing testimony, but um, So yeah, not, why don't we, why don't we, you run through it for us, and then, um, then we'll have an opportunity for discussion and amendments. 
Yes, I as think well we'll do it by as well program as testimony. area. Yeah. Yes, both. I think we'll do it by program area just to keep it straight. Otherwise, yep. it's too messy. Sounds good. Um, so, Meg, I just for people following in the audience, um, we'll take them in the order that they appear in the document so you can follow along. And um, that means Meg is up first. All right. Um, so the early childhood um, program area, there are three strategies that have been proposed. Intensive home visiting for children uh, prenatal to three years old. Uh, preschool Head Start or Structured Preschool-like Experience for Children 3 to 5, ages 3 to 5, and Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation to um, Child Care Settings, Preschools, and Home Visiting Programs. So the um, investment allocation recommendation is to invest up to 50% toward intensive home visiting for very young children, up to 35% to the Preschool Head Start or Preschool-like Experiences, and up to 15% in early childhood mental health consultation. These three strategies are the result, um, have been formulated as a result of public input. They are also based on um, current research in the field and uh, what is suggested to accomplish the goals that we have for this program area, which are to support early, children's early development and readiness for kindergarten. Um, and the allocation suggestions are based on balancing the size of the population that is being suggested to be served, for example, um, the size of the population prenatal three is larger than the size of population three to five. So part of investing up to 50% in that strategy is around sort of size of the population eligible. It's also a balance of the cost of the service um, for the types of outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Uh, preschool is a very expensive service to offer, um, and expensive services mean that with our fund we, funding, we serve fewer children with the total funding we have available. So um, the larger um, allocation recommendation to home visiting is an attempt to balance a lesser expensive service that tends to produce good outcomes for children, that can reach more children than the preschool um, strategy, however, the preschool strategy is possibly the most effective that we can do to prepare young children for school. So we still want to have a sizable um, investment in that. And then finally, the smallest um, portion of funds um, recommendation, excuse me, the smallest portion of funds recommended for allocation as program area is toward a strategy that supports parents and early childhood practitioners in their work in the other two strategies as well and in other settings. So it's a really a, a tiered strategy for this age group and this population. And again, I want to remind you that every um, the strategy and the priorities within the strategies and the priorities within each of them really are based on strong themes from our public input as well as research and also local data on needs of our population. So with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions and then we can open it up for discussion among you all and testimony from the audience. Any well, what's, what's the will of the committee? Do you want to have them run through all of the strategies first, or do you want to take each one, one at a time and discuss? I could take discuss? each one at a time. OK. And then we can offer amendments at the appropriate time then. So, Great. Okay. So um, any discussion or? Um, yes. Any questions I can answer? Or? Okay. So Julie, I know you sent an email this morning in this area about or was that, that was, I'm sorry, that was child abuse. Child abuse okay, never mind. That's the next area. <laughs> okay, and no questions, no discussion? Right. No questions. Do you want to open it up for testimony from members of the audience if there are individuals who have something they want to say about this program area? Okay. So anybody wishes to testify about the proposed allocation to the strategies in this program area? Or the strategies themselves? Or the or strategies or? themselves, yes. <clears throat> I see a hand out there. Is that Ken Thrasher? Come on up, Ken. Yep. So uh, just give us your name, and you have you know three minutes. I'm Ken Thrasher. Uh, I just wanted to talk about a big picture here, because I think as we look at individual strategies, sometimes we kind of lose the context of what we're trying to accomplish across all of these parts of the continuum of education. And I think if we look at uh, how we define strategies, and I'm going to speak specifically about mentoring and the focus from ninth grade on. Uh, I think we have to be a little careful. Uh, we, we have in this document 
a lot of strategies from early childhood to mentoring to college and career and professional development. And I think they need to be connected in a way that's pretty strategic so we aren't just leaving gaps in this continuum. And so I'm a little concerned if we go into an early childhood investment and then we transition that child into a, a school environment where they don't have a caring adult, we can uh, run into issues like fade out. And fade out's a very costly mistake if we let that happen because what happens is that child can lose some of the benefits of early childhood. Did so you say, starting, Ken, did you say fade out? It's called fade out. It's a, okay. it's a research term that talks about the loss of the benefits of early childhood investments if you don't stay with the child with strategies that connect the dots and keep them on the right track. And the key there is the relationship. And then what are the youth development strategies you wrap around that? Those can be health. Those could be non-cognitive skill developments. Those can be a lot of things. And they don't start at ninth grade. You know, Sam Adams came one time to the... Uh, one of the committees I was on, he talked about just starting at ninth grade counts. The reality is we can give a lot of kids to the system that are struggling at ninth grade. So if we don't get mentoring focused also in those earlier years from K to ninth grade, we're going we're gonna to create a gap of, of service for these kids that some of them are going to have fade out. And then taking them on to kind of a post-secondary focus. So I really want to be sure that when we define these strategies, they somehow connect and aren't just independent silos, which is our, what we have done with our education system. It's time to really be strategic about how we connect the dots and make these resources work on a, a continuum of service that is in the best interests of the student. Okay, great. Thank Thank you. Thanks, Kim. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, then. Um, Let's move on to the next area, the next strategy area, which is uh, child abuse prevention and intervention. Um, do, before we do that, do you want to, if there isn't, do you want to make a decision about the strategies if there's not discussion or disagreement about whether to go with these strategies or not in early childhood? Do you want to conclude that rather than trying? Because I'm not sure that you'll feel the same way about all of the strategy area, about all the program areas. You might want to not vote on some. You may want to vote on others. Okay. Why don't we go through them all, let's do the amendments, and then we can decide if we're ready to vote on moving ahead with all or some of these. Does that sound all right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. The next program area is child abuse prevention and intervention. The goal for this funding area is to prevent child abuse and neglect and to support vulnerable families. To this end, we're proposing two strategies. Um, the first is really a prevention-focused strategy on strengthening parenting skills and resilience. And the second is more of an intervention focus, addressing trauma through therapeutic intervention. Both of these strategies, strategies were highlighted um, as needs within the community input process um, and are supported through, uh, through research as well. Um, staff is, uh, this is one of the areas that we didn't have uh, percentage breakdowns previously. Um, at this point, staff's recommending that we invest um, up to 60% in the first strategy, prevention-focused um, parenting skills and resilience, and up to 40% in the second strategy, uh, therapeutic intervention. Um, and the rationale for this is to more heavily invest in the prevention-focused strategy because it's more effective and um, less costly than trying to respond and treat uh, child abuse and neglect, and um, it's, more, it's more effective. Um, additionally, it was supported through community input to more heavily invest in prevention versus intervention. Um, additionally, with, within this, um, we have had some community input. Um, one piece of input at the last meeting um, was um, encouraging the levy not to lose sight of intervention services. Um, and then we also heard um, through written comment to consider adding immigrant and refu refugee populations um, to the focus populations and um, to favor culturally specific services. So, um, do folks have questions that I can answer? I've got a question, Dan. So Lisa, in... Um, Section one of early childhood, we the title line is intensive home desk visiting, and in 
Uh, this section in the first sentence, it refer references comprehensive parenting programs. So could you talk a little bit about, um, is there overlap, and if not, why not? Overlap between the two funding areas and the yeah. parenting, and that's a great question. There, are, there is overlap in different funding areas that we have, especially um, between <coughs> child abuse prevention intervention and early childhood, where parenting is um, a strategy that crosses both of those areas. Um, the, you know, what we've done in the past is programs can choose which area they would like to apply for funding, and some can be considered in both funding areas. If it's a strategy or if it's a service that could be considered an early childhood, addressing one of the early childhood strategies or a strategy within child abuse. Um, so there's overlap in terms of um, the type of service, but really the focus populations that would be served most likely in the child abuse area are gonna be higher risk um, families, higher risk for child abuse and neglect would be the defining piece. Do you have anything to add? With and, that? and they may have children older than age three too. So right, exactly. hopefully there's a um, ability for the programs to complement each other. I think overlap can be um, somewhat of a confusing term because somehow it applies that there's duplication or not um, clarity or distinction between those things. And I think it's more probably helpful to think of them as complementary as opposed to overlapping. Well, I guess um, maybe I could be more specific. It, it, let's just say I, I was proposing and my program focused on that younger group of kids and it involved intensive parenting it seems like I would be able to apply to both of these fit within it and really have have two buckets to hopefully uh, uh, hit as opposed to just one. I mean, we just to make clear, and folks who have in the audience who, yes, we allowed that last time, and um, we haven't addressed that specific issue this time around, but what we allow people to do is um, if, they, if they were proposing a program that would fit in multiple areas, they could apply in multiple areas, make that clear, and that they were submitting for more than one area. And then just depending on the order of the funding meetings and when the decisions were made in each area, it, the application was first considered in whichever area was discussed first. So if you applied in early childhood and child abuse and, child, and early childhood decisions were made first, you would first be discussed and included in that round. And if you were not funded in that round, your application would move to the next round for consideration. It's only scored once, so you get one review and one score, but it's just transferred over. So that happened with the number of, of programs last time around. So I think our intention would be, because, we, because our program areas, some are about age and some are about topic, they're naturally going to overlap. If you, if you only define your program areas by age, then you wouldn't have that issue, but we don't. So that, there's going to be some yeah, you know, and, and cross I'm, sections I'm, there. I'm not using that term derogatorily. I, I don't think it's bad. Mm -hmm. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. So I think we would allow that again because I don't see any way other, you know, to accommodate that, and that's what seems fair okay. to me. Um, I, have, I would recommend, actually, that we invest um, more in um, the prevention strategies. I would increase that to 70% um, and have um, up to 30% to address um, trauma through therapeutic intervention. Primarily, really, and I, the staff has already stated this, that um, prevention is the, is the best way for us to address child maltreatment. And I would especially note also that it's too easy for, to forget that child maltreatment includes neglect. I, I know it's, it's been acknowledged today and it's in writing, um, but that it's so easy for the public to think about child abuse as children who've been physically or sexually abused. And the vast majority of children who fall into maltreatment, it is neglect. It's um, a matter of children who aren't, their emotional needs aren't being met um, because of family crisis, because of isolation, because of depressed parents. Um, any number of reasons that children's um, social emotional needs aren't being met. And that right there is a problem for certainly children zero to three, but, but I agree that these families have children who are every age. And I think that be really focusing more on prevention is, is where we should be investing public dollars. So I would increase that amount. I certainly support programs that address um, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic needs of children who have been abused or at risk of reabuse. If you want, I don't like that term, but um, 
So that would be my proposal. Okay, so that's a proposed amendment, and why don't we, at this point, open it up? I think, if, unless there's further questions of staff, we could have testimony. Discussion. Okay, discussion. And discussion. discussion. Yeah. Um, is there a, there's no zero to three in this prevention or the therapeutic, is it? It's, it would be zero to 18 for zero both. Zero to 18, so um, just across. Strategies. Um, gosh, um, because I think that the trauma right now for trauma and abuse is so high for the populations that you're trying to reach, I, I would hate to reduce that from 40 because it's, it's so much out there. I mean, there's not enough out there, and that's what I'm trying to say. And with the abuse being high, the neglect being high, and I know that prevention's really important, but when you look at the programs and you look at the populations that's being served as far as, and what's included in that therapeutic, is it mental health counseling? What exactly is included in that? Um, this, you're asking, the um, services would be, I would imagine, therapeutic types of services. That could be therapeutic classrooms, um, individual counseling or therapy, family counseling, therapy, um, trauma assessments, those kinds of services. I guess, okay. uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think it's always hard to balance you know, prevention with intervention, but I right. think when we're looking at addressing trauma with children um, who have, ex have experienced abuse um, and, and looking at the larger mental health uh, issues that our community is dealing with, I mean, state and local funding only addresses 30% of the need, and by helping these children at an early age address their trauma, we are we're preventing the problems that they could have as adults. You know, self-medicating with drugs. You know, their their mental health issues. Um, you know, escalating. So, I mean, I, I think it's always a tough call. But for me, um, I think addressing the addressing the trauma. I'm I'm comfortable with staff recommendation with the 60/40. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Well, why don't we uh, open it up to see if anybody, does anybody wishes to testify on the proposed strategies and investment allocations on, on child abuse prevention intervention? Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hand. Okay, okay um, so, do you want to offer that as, as an amendment? I, I, yes, I do want to offer that as, a, okay. as an amendment. Okay. Do you want to continue taking each strategy one by one as you originally proceeded, or did you want to change your procedure um, right now? In other words, do you want to hear foster care next and hold Julie's amendment and come back at the end, or do you want to? Um... Let's, let's wait till the end. Okay. Okay. And then I'll get my amendment out there, and if there's any other amendments, then we can vote on them all in one, one fell swoop. Okay. So we're moving on to foster care. Uh, the goal for this program area is to support the well-being and development of children and youth in foster care. To this end, three strategies have been proposed. Academic support, early childhood through college. Support for youth transitioning from foster care to adulthood, 14 years old through 24 years old. And permanency for youth, um, and that would be any age between 0 and 24, but most likely older youth. Um, all these strategies were highlighted as needs through community input and are supported by research. Um, the staff recommendation for breakdown of funding is 40% for strategy one, the education or the academic support, and 30% each for strategies two and three. Um, and primarily the rationale for that is just that strategy one has a larger age range um, to serve. So far, community input um, in this strategy area is um, to expand the focus populations to include children with high mobility and those with disabilities, and also to um, support was expressed for the permanency strategy as it stands. I do want to make one note, and that is that um, foster parent recruitment and training and support was highlighted um, throughout the community input as a great need in this funding area. Um, and staff recognizes that quality foster care is absolutely critical to the foster care system. Um, however, staff has not recommended a standalone 
um, strategy for this particular um, activity um, because we didn't feel that it was the appropriate role for the levy. However, um, you will notice that um, there has been given uh, priority or favor to programs that incorporate the involvement and um, training of foster care within each of the strategy areas. Any questions regarding strategies or the allocation proposed? Questions or no. comments? Lisa, I've got a question. Sure. Uh, um, is there, did, is, does the uh, research show that there is um, evidence that culturally specific placements um, uh, impact success in, fos in um, foster care? Is there evidence? I'm not sure if there's um, evidence. I mean, there's, I'm not aware of what the evidence is. Um, you know, talking with, with youth, some youth say absolutely they want to be placed in with a family that is culturally the same as them. Um, in talking with youth in community input, also heard people's youth say, I want to be part of a family that takes care of me and that meets my needs. And um, one person specifically said he liked being in culturally diverse <laughs> families because then he got to experience and understand other cultures as well. So I think that's a complicated question and may come down to the individual um, child. Um, and But there's certainly... Um, a family that's of the same culture is going to understand you in a different way than someone who's from a different culture. So I think it's a complicated question, and I'm not aware of specific research that definitively shows one is better um, than another. Other questions or discussion? Is there anybody that wishes to uh, testify on, on foster care on the proposed uh, Funding allocations within the strategy? Okay. Don't see anybody raising their hand. So let's uh, move on to our next area, which is uh, I believe it's after school. After school proposed strategy direction. So the goal in this program area is to provide safe and constructive after school and summer programming that supports children's well being and school success. Um, the strategies are intensive academic support. 65 to 75 percent of the uh, of the resources going into intensive academic support specifically that's tied I think this is a key piece to keep in mind that's tied um, uh, to this to the curriculum that's being taught at the school to the staff that, um, that is at the school and to the child's caretakers you know parents or guardians um, so that it's it's well connected and embedded not just sort of outside um, second strategy is enrichment um, activities and those are um, any kind of enrichment programming would be eligible to apply um, with priority for physical activity in the arts because those were the two that really rose to the top in public input. And the last strategy is to um, expand the Sun Community School System with additional sites um, where there is not currently uh, Sun programming um, with the least amount of investment. Um, the rationale, um, or I guess I should, the, the public input that came through, so there was public input at the meeting and there was some that came through in written format um, between meetings um, and not a lot on after school. Um, one piece of public input was just generally supportive of the strategies as currently stated. Um, another piece of input emphasizing the importance of engagement um, of youth um, and, and providing opportunities for art and sports and play in the after school hours um, in addition to academic support. So reminding the committee to be thinking about the whole child, not just only about academics. Um, and, and I would say that kind of the rationale behind these strategies was to address all of those. Academic um, support was the, was loud and clear um, through the public input as uh, the most important strategy to fund and the most mentioned strategy to fund by far. Um, in, uh, Which one was that? The academic support. Academic support, um, right. as, okay. the, as the biggest need. If you want to, when we ask people about what would you prioritize for need, that was um, the most mentioned across all forms of public input. Um, so there was consistent input on that. Um, in terms of the allocation percentages that staff recommended, um, we recommend the largest share of resources um, to the service area that, as I said, received the most support and public input, and also where services are more intensive and that's more costly. So if you're going to provide intensive academic support that's really connected to the child's milieu, it's costly. It takes a lot of fair amount of staff time to do that. Um, 
we allocated a, a smaller portion of resources for lower enrichment services are generally lower cost because you're it's it's you have a lower you have a higher ratio of adults to children um, and you're not it's a less intensive service the total amount of hours that you're offering a child is less um, but yet um, it was clear that through public input people wanted um, to provide access to arts and and physical activity um, to all kids who were interested in participating and that we that part of our role is to expand that access um, so we we allocated some funds but just a smaller portion and then in terms of allocating resources to the sun to expand the sun system again that was something that came through public input people want more sun community school sites um, um, also came through the sun council that would um, which is the the group of partners that kind of oversee the sun system um, would like to be able to see expansion in that system if at all possible um, staff was one trying to moderate how much we expand because um, we essentially have this group in the previous iteration agreed to keep the funding um, for that for the for each site at a constant level um, to assure that similar programming is offered um, throughout the system so that there aren't some schools that you know have twice the funding of others so that it kind of equalizes the resources um, so given that uh, we recommended that we require a match um, and so that we are not the sole funder um, to in include other partners and um, also to moderate the level of expansion because the system we it, this is a partnered system where many people are putting resources in to be careful not to expand too much because the system is trying to hold itself together and support all of those sites um, so that was kind of the thinking behind that rationale um, and that's and there was no particular public input on that piece um, so I guess any questions and discussion about after school I have a question. Yeah. Um, it says invest 60, 75%. Mm -hmm. Which are you keeping in the middle or which is it? <laughs> Hang on. 65. Oh, 65. 65. 65. 65. I was going to say, I thought it was 65 to 75. I thought that's what I wrote. So hopefully I did. Yeah, it um, is. Yes. Um, again, providing a range for flexibility was really the idea. So idealize, we hopefully hit a minimum of 65 and ideally not more than 75. Um, so it, you know, it's just trying to provide a, a range. Again, I think you have to think about these as goals. So it depends partly on what comes through the door and, and then what the quality of what comes through the door in terms of applications is. So I guess I have a question about under enrichment programming, uh, prior, prioritizing uh, physical activity in the arts. So I guess mm -hmm. I'm thinking on the one hand, Portland voters just approved a new tax dedicated to arts education in our school. So how does that, um, how do I reconcile that, that there's going to be increased access to arts now in every school in the city of Portland with this specific prioritization here? I think the main, I mean, the, the, I would say the main things I've heard in the community in, in terms of public input are that arts is one of the most engaging things we can offer kids. And, um, and many kids, even though hopefully this, this arts tax will lead to better expansion during the school day, um, a lot of kids are um, very much enticed and interested in participating in arts programming after school. So it's often a great hook to get kids to do something instructive after school um, for kids who might not otherwise be inclined. Um, and I think there's just, there is great support in this community for the arts and for access to the for all for the arts and so I think I mean th that was that was really right out of the public input that was th these were the two areas that rose to the top in terms of mentioned frequency of need um, or of desire to provide that kind of programming so it's I think it's true that the arts tax should lead to more um, stuff during the school day but I'm not sure that it addresses what happens in the after school hours and what's available in the after school hours was there any discussion about um, stem um, science, technology, engineering, and math mm -hmm. enrichment yes. programming, and what was the what was the input from the public? Not as exciting as not as exciting as art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was input. I mean, I would say that was um, yeah. that was the next. And in, in the, I can't. I have to pull up my public input report. That was the next level down. That was that was something that was mentioned, but it was mentioned in fairness far less frequently than either arts or physical activity. I think the obesity crisis is is really on people's minds, and I think that mm -hmm. probably led to the to the strong emphasis on physical activity. And I think um, people are looking for, I, I would say that when I talk to practitioners, they need to find things that will engage kids. And, and I think that is part of the goal of after school is to find things that are engaging. So hopefully 
that if we prioritize enrichment programming that's occurring in a context where there's also options for academic enrichment, that mm -hmm. a lot of times the engaging, fun programming is in, enticing somebody to stay after school and participate and also get the academic support that they need. So it's, it's kind of... Um, that's, I would say that's driving a significant amount of what people are, or why people are supportive of that, if that makes sense. Um, and it's not to say that we don't need both. I think people would say we do need both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one more. I like to propose um, increasing the sun to 20%. And increasing the sun to 20% from? From the 15%. From 15, okay. Adding 5% to it. Okay. Reducing the intensive support down to by five. And reducing the intensive academic support by 5%. Okay. Okay, so um, if there's no further questions from us, this would be a good time to see if anybody in the public wants to testify on, on the after school component. I guess we have one person. Come on, come on up. Okay. Okay. Oh, we got two, right. two people. Three. Yeah, we're together. <laughs> okay, welcome. If you want to just uh, give us your name and affiliation, if you care to, and you each have uh, three minutes. Uh, I'm Mike Conway with the Community Cycling Center. To my left is Johnny Ling uh, from the Community Cycling Center as well. I'm Kelly Hansen from the Community Cycling Center. Um, we would like to uh, strongly recommend and reinforce uh, the strategy um, enrichment programming um, and also uh, the New Sun Community Schools um, for uh, a number of reasons, but most particularly is that we feel that when New Sun's Community School sites are funded, that it actually gives organizations that uh, currently partner with Sun Community Schools uh, more opportunity to expand the services that they, they offer through those partner organizations and Sun Schools. Um, and uh, we feel that those organizations that particularly work with physical activity, experiential learning, work with the low income, uh, fam families of low income and underserved communities will have more opportunity to not only continue being funded and partnering with, with Sun Schools, but now more opportunity to work with newer Sun community sites. Um, additionally, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm going to make a recommendation <laughs> to, uh, to increase enrichment programming from 20% up to 25%. I think that would uh, work really well with uh, Ms. Sotomayor Wesley's recommendation to uh, increase the new Sun Community Schools from 15 to 20%. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sir? We were just here to support Mike. Or... <laughs> and I have one more point as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, on the same note, I wanted to, to point out how many of the enrichment programs and the SUN programs are incidentally providing academic support. So, for example, we have a bike club right now. We partner with a SUN program. Our kids come after school there, uh, brimming with energy. They ride their bikes. They get this physical activity. We have this uh, team building aspect where they can learn to focus and transfer those skills academically. They go back to their SUN program and have homework club after that. So it's a fantastic combination, and those programs wouldn't really be applying for intensive academic support, but children who participate in enrichment programming through the SUN programs are able to get that academic support as well. So I wanted to point out that although sometimes these enrichment programs and SUN programs aren't specifically focused on intensive academic support, they are providing academic support, and I would agree that funding the enrichment programs and the SUN programs um, will give our children the academic support they need. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, come on up. You can just uh, give us your name, uh, affiliation if you wish to, and then you have three minutes. Uh, my name is Seth Truby, and I'm the executive director of Bravo Youth Orchestras. It's a new nonprofit working at Rosa Parks Elementary in uh, North Portland. I actually didn't prepare any comments because I didn't realize there was going to be the opportunity to say anything. I just want to speak briefly in support of the engagement on the arts side. Uh, we just started a new program at Rosa Parks, which is one of the priority schools in the district. 95% poverty, 18 languages spoken. Uh, if you're not familiar with Rosa Parks, it's a lovely school community. Um, they have a big task in terms of 
bringing these kids uh, up and overcoming the, the barriers to success in life. Um, you can look at the, um, the demographics. I don't need to preach about that. We chose Rosa Parks specifically because we wanted to participate in a community that had a lot of supports but was missing the arts piece. They have the Charles Jordan Community Center and they have a lot of different academic um, parts coming together. They also have active partnership from home forward. But nobody was really providing arts on a big scale. Ethos was working there in a small way. Um, we are now providing um, school day instruction for all of the kindergartners and first graders who get violin twice a week. Uh, in addition, we have an after school program that meets every day for two hours for 40 children in second and third grades. And it's beautiful to see what's already happening in the community. We just started two months ago. Um, the kids are learning, they have choir for half an hour, then they have sectionals where they practice violin, viola, or cello for an hour, and then they come together for orchestra for half an hour. Um, today, this afternoon, when I go back to school, at 2 o'clock we're going to have Jen Arnold, uh, who's a violist for the Oregon Symphony. She's coming out as a guest artist. We have a whole series of guest artists from um, all different walks of life who come and share their music with the kids uh, to show them the different places that music can take you. We have a global map that shows where our guest artists have played music, and it's, it's filling up. All the kids get to put in a pin on the map where their families are from, and it's quite an international group there. Um, and after the guest artist, we're going to have a recital for the parents, where the parents are invited to come see the kids. It's a little warm-up. On December 4th, we're going to have our first concert at the Charles Jordan Community Center, um, and the kids are going to prepare a recital after having played violin for about, violin, viola, and cello for about two months. This is just a pilot program we just started, but it's an exciting example of how arts can be used to really transform the community and have a big impact uh, by meeting every day and get, giving the kids a sense of teamwork and accomplishment. Um, so I really support any allocation towards uh, arts and engagement as part of the puzzle for what we can do for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to our next area, which is mentoring strategy, mentoring strategy. In, mentor in mentoring, staff has recommend, uh, recommended only one strategy uh, that supports the goal of connecting children and youth with caring adult role models that support their well-being. Um, the strategy that is proposed support is supports for students' academic achievement um, and or post-secondary pursuits. And um, the basis for this strategy came um, directly out of public input. Uh, it was very strongly suggested across all three sources of input that we gathered that um, the mentoring uh, be focused on this type of work. Um, there's also research that suggests that mentoring that does focus on this work produces these types of gains with children. Um, I want to clarify a couple of points um, around which there seems, there seems to be confusion. One of them is the age range um, for focus of this strategy. Historically, our mentoring um, grants have always been open to serving children ages 5 to 18. There is no recommendation in this strategy to change that age range. There is a recommendation to prioritize teens, um, and prioritize by that we mean, again, a preference for, not a requirement for, serving that age range. And by teens, um, I didn't define that term here in, in formulating this recommendation, but my suggestion was middle schoolers and high schoolers, and, and that is somewhat um, uh, suggested in here by um, listing the types of examples of the types of things that might be supported in this uh, strategy. Um, the other sort of main uh, feature of this strategy that's suggested is that the mentoring strategy focus on work with children um, that is more intensive and has a longer duration. And the suggested recommendation from staff is programs that can work with children for at least up to two years. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to um, take any questions and then open it up for discussion and testimony. Any questions? No. I have a comment. Um, I don't know if it's exactly a question, but... Um, I, I noticed right away that this um, is written, supports for students' academic achievement and or post-secondary pursuits. And I would say that um, supporting children's academic achievement should be the goal, and if you do that, that, it will, uh, that you should, in, in a sense, be also then encouraging post-secondary pursuits, but that you wouldn't need a standalone program I'm not opposed to standalone programs, but I do think it's important to make sure that we are 
really working with the children who are most likely to fail. And in going back through some of the data that staff has shared over the last several months, um, I noted, um, this is from an all hands raised um, document, Education, Equity, and Excellence from Cradle to Career, um, a report, many pages long. <laughs> and um, a particular um, chart in this document, figure 10, children's academic outcomes in Multnomah County by race and ethnicity for the 2011-2012 school year. I noticed that the greatest drop off in how children are performing happens between elementary school and finishing high school. That if children finish high school, they are more in, the, they have a greater chance than of going on to post-secondary pursuit. That the real play area in which we are losing kids is after eighth grade or after ninth grade really that huge drops, particularly for children of color, for Native American children and African American children and Latinos, that is the biggest drop in academic achievement. So I would be very worried if we didn't, um, I would say, prioritize that age group. I certainly don't want, I respect mentoring age five all the way to getting into post-secondary. But this is, the data is showing us that in our community anyway, this is where the biggest problem is. When you say that age group, you're meaning ninth grade yes. on? Yeah. Okay. So the existing priority is articulated just as teens. Are you suggesting amending it to limit its definition or are you comfortable with the priority as it's stated now? Um, the priority is I read it um, for, are you talking about utter rationale? Um, no, in the strategy it's document itself, I think it's the third sentence. It begins with... investments to serve youth, particularly teens, intensively and have duration of at least two years. Um, I would want to prioritize... Um, I would want to pri prioritize um, high school... I mean, prior, pre previous to that, it says focus could include tutoring, educational advocacy for youth, supports for transitions between middle school and high school, or from high school to post-secondary pursuit. And I think, I think that those would be all areas that we would want to consider funding. Um, but I would prioritize investments for um, students grades 8 to 12. And also, certainly, the, the intensity and duration of at least two years. I wouldn't want to take that away. And just to clarify, Julie, when you say prioritize, you also mean a preference, not a requirement. Preference. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Just double checking. I'm just Thank clarifying you. for yes. everyone here. Thank you. Yep. Okay, but wait, I heard two different things. I heard, I heard grades 8 through 12, then I heard high school. So which do you want? Well, I think that... I, I believe part of this is that transition from eight to nine is included in there. So I don't. Okay. Um, okay. Just I, I think sure. that's part of high school. Okay. So it sounds like your amendment is for eight grades eight through twelve. Yeah. They, okay. 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 Great. We'll, we'll come back to those. And okay. Do we have anybody wishes to testify on the uh, proposed strategy direction for mentoring? I see two hands. Come on up. Welcome, and if you can just uh, give us your name and uh, affiliation if you wish, and then you each have uh, three minutes. My name is Julie Larson. I am here from Friends of the Children. Um, and first of all, I also want to um, commend the staff on making the recommendation for intensity and duration. Um, definitely believe that that's very important and, and appreciate that definition. Um, I do want to also support Ken's statement about the continuum, and I know that there are a lot of statistics showing the drop-off happening in that transition. Um, it's one of the examples that we talk about in uh, the strategies and the rationale was uh, the 20% of youth failing to earn adequate credits. 
um, as of ninth grade. And that starts to happen before the ninth grade. Um, that's, a, that's a progression of challenges that pile on to these kids' lives that do lead to those sorts of drop-offs. And so earlier investment is something that we feel is really important. Um, definitely want to see the transitions supported, but to maybe have some language that actually does call out that the earlier years are also important. Um, as far as the connection to career, um, having career aspirations actually does um, support academic achievement. And so I also support the fact that there is in, some information in here about post-secondary, um, that in those teenage years, if you can give that aspiration for a career and a vision for that, that that's actually supportive of academics. And then in general, I just also would like to see some additional language. I think the one strategy of academics is important, but academics is about so much more. Mentoring is about so much more, and all of these things do need to in place, be in place, including social and emotional development, um, behavioral support, health. All of those things lead to uh, an individual's ability to, to achieve, so to only single out achievement in academics alone as though that's the only thing um, that we're focusing on. I think we might lose some of the essence of what mentoring is about as people apply for funding. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rebecca Lowcamp. I'm with FRC Team 1432. Uh, you asked about STEM and why it wasn't considered a carrot. I have to say that we focus on getting all of our kids to graduate and considering they enter the ninth grade three grade levels behind, um, it's really hard to get them there. Um, their carrot to get their grades up to passing, which for us is a C, is that they get to build a robot, a real robot. <laughs> and that has such pull for their kid, these kids. They bring their homework to robots, and they sit there, and they do their homework watching the other kids building the robot because they know when it's done, then they get to get up and work on the robot, too. Who doesn't so love robots? It we is love robots. <laughs> big draw. Um, I, can't, I can't express how important it is that the life skills in, is such an important part of mentoring. We have kids who come in who literally cannot speak in front of strangers. And it took us three years to get one young man through that condition. Uh, his, his sister was a Gorth for a week and had to drop out of school. Um, but his senior year, because of the work we did with him, he was able to participate on the constitutional law team for his high school and went all the way to state. So academics are important. Life skills are important. It's, it's a whole big field in mentoring. And we can't do enough for these kids because 25% of the 2,000 kids in Southeast Portland are simply written off the books. I have gone into the office to register kids and have seen the counselors going, you'll be happier if you just go to another program. You really don't want to register for high school. And, you know, it's sad. But that's what mentors do. They stand up for their kids and they help them get through those hard spots. I hope you continue to support us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you both. Oh, we have one. Go ahead. Come on up. Come on up. Anybody else wish to testify on mentoring? Okay, well, uh, yeah, come on up. Let's, let's get everybody up here first. Anybody else? Okay, welcome. Uh, just give us your name, affiliation, if you wish, and then you each have three minutes, and we'll start with you. Great. My name is Matt Bartolotti. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Metropolitan Family Service. Uh, I, don't in, I don't have any uh, prepared remarks today, but I did want to say that I, we would um, strongly recommend that we keep the original language that's contained in the mentoring um, strategies. We believe that the way it's currently written um, would provide for the greatest degree of flexibility and in integration of uh, interventions that can help youth across um, their academic careers. So we would just like to recommend strongly that the original language that's kind of in the proposal now be used and we don't necessarily prioritize uh, youth um, from eighth grade to uh, 12th grade. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Justine Reimnitz and I'm with the Native American Youth and Family Center. And it's actually interesting, I'm, I 
uh, to piggyback off of what you were just saying, I have kind of some similar comments um, around uh, this strategy in terms of getting youth uh, prepared for post-secondary pursuits. Um, one of the problems that we actually see consistently with the youth that we work with uh, is that when they actually do come to us, they're already credit deficient, um, and they simply do not uh, uh, haven't been uh, exposed to a, cult, a college going culture uh, already at the ages that they're at, already in high school. Um, so uh, it is a big uh, task even to get these students to be eligible for post secondary pursuits. Um, and oftentimes uh, they just simply aren't ready at the 12th grade. Um, and it may take a couple more years of mentoring um, in order to get them uh, at the level in which uh, they are ready to even apply. Uh, so uh, in the rationale does have kind of an age range of that 16 to 24. And that's actually what we see a lot of in uh, communities of color, uh, uh, low income, uh, people who come from low income backgrounds, uh, that that is actually a more realistic age range. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, when we talk about uh, setting a specific uh, grade levels at which this strategy would be directed, uh, uh, maybe kind of short-sighted, um, and when we're talking about the population that, that could really actually benefit the most uh, from this strategy. So, Great. thank you. Thank you both. Okay, so we'll move on now to our last uh, strategy area, and that is hunger relief. Okay, so the goal in um, the hunger relief program area was to expand access to healthy, nutritious food for hungry children, just to remind folks that the strategies were designed around that. And the strategies that um, staff recommended um, based on public input were increased access to and utilization of existing programs. Um, so that means supporting a variety of methods uh, to um, increase access to programs like WIC and SNAP and um, other federal programs that support um, school meals um, or meals during the summer um, and other school-based emergency food programs. So, I'm sorry, Julie, did you have a question? Okay, you were looking like you had a question. Um, the second strategy was to increase school-based food pantries with the rationale that we, um, many families, uh, most families with children come to school. And um, so this is a way to provide food in a dispersed um, manner that allows access for many people who otherwise don't have uh, ability to travel toward other community-based pantry sites. Um, third strategy was increased access to food during summer. Um, this was, a, again, a high priority in public input and a time when um, school meals are not kids who get fed in school, breakfast and lunch, and sometimes supper too, don't have access to those, um, those sources of food during the summer. Um, last was alternative approaches, and that was really um, designed because we have not funded in this area before, and um, we felt that we should be open to um, perhaps ideas that we haven't thought of or that didn't come up in public input because every any public input process is constrained by who you talk to. Um, so this would sort of leave an opening for um, approaches that are not one of those three things. Um, just as a side note, um, staff did not recommend a percentage division of resources in this, um, stra in this program area because there was nothing in public input that I could really use as a basis for that. There was not a strong recommendation of one over another or more of this as compared to each other. And um, the other thing is that we have we have not funded in the past and so we don't know what, what kinds of, what the field of applicants looks like necessarily for this program area. And so um, I didn't feel I had a basis really to recommend to you other than I could make it up. But um, I didn't um, feel like I could give you a rationale. And so I left this open. If you, if there are committee members who feel strongly or have um, um, some thoughts on how those resources should be divided up, I think now's the time to to raise that, but staff didn't feel like we had um, information on which to base that. Um, so in terms of public input that we received um, between meetings on this topic area and, and, the, and in the first meeting, um, there was um, some support for allowing that alternative approaches um, piece in there. Um, uh, someone got up and spoke in favor of that, but other than that, there was no um, other specific input in this area to consider in between meetings. Um, are there any um, questions or other discussion? I have a uh, a few changes I'd like to offer for the, the hunger relief section. 
And um, I've, I passed out the actual amendment language, but um, the three strategies for hunger relief uh, propose prioritizing funding for programs that include uh, nutrition and cooking education. And uh, I guess I'm concerned about adding priorities in the area of hunger relief since the whole area is really uh, something we have not had experience with. And I'm, I'm, af I'm afraid that we should, or I guess I'm urging us not to be so prescriptive as to actually insert a particular area that would be uh, a prior priority criteria in our funding decisions. And you know, while nutrition education is certainly an important factor, uh, you know, I'm worried that we would be encouraging all programs that submit an application to add this component when it may not fit uh, with a particular program area. And it also may detract from what I think the overall goal of, of hunger relief is, and that is to feed hungry children. Um, and then my other change is to, so I would propose deleting the sentence uh, where it's mentioned that says prior, prioritize programs that add nutrition funding or cooking. So that's, I guess, part of my proposed change. And then my other change is we talk about increasing access to food during the summertime. And I also think I've heard uh, that it's also important that we think about this for winter breaks and spring breaks too. So I would uh, modify that by saying uh, that we add the out of school time, in addition to summer programs, out of school time, primarily spring and summer breaks if I'm missing anything else. So those are my proposed changes. So uh, is there any other discussion or discussion about my proposed changes or should we move on to testimony? I wonder if staff could talk a little bit about um, the nutrition and cooking education. I understand that that came through um, public input and certainly there's, um, there's been a movement toward food justice that includes sort of not just hunger relief but all aspects of of, of food, including uh, nutri nutrition and healthy healthy bodies, and um, that food is healthy food, culturally appropriate food is a is a right. Um, and so, could you talk just a little bit about a little bit about that and 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 why it came up as an important to the public? Um, so this is similar, I would say, to the foster care um, issue where um, uh, training and support for foster parents was a huge need that came through across, and, and we didn't feel that it was appropriate for a, st a standalone strategy, that it was something that ought to be embedded in other strategies. And that was the same here. This was, I mean, the reason it's in all three of those strategies is because it was came out very strongly in public input as something that was necessary and needed. Um, and um, we were concerned, I mean, the other pieces of advice that came in different ways, not necessarily through the broad surveys where people didn't have as much space to talk or write, was that standalone education and nutrition programs were not the way to go, that you needed to embed. So for instance, WIC, um, which is a federal program um, for women, um, infants, and children, um, it, that part of that program, in order to participate in it, you have to participate in the education component. That's part of the deal, with the concept being that if you're teaching people with young children how to feed and how to you know begin engaging taste buds from the beginning we have the best shot at preventing poor eating habits over the long haul um, so th that was kind of the, the message that came through input about embedding that strategy in the other strategies was to try to encourage um, to the extent that people wanted to do nutrition education and um, and cooking education um, and shopping on a budget those kind and those things came up in all areas of input that they would embed it with something that was already, that was about feeding, you know, it was both food and it was, they were together. And mm -hmm. WIC is that, is, is a similar model. Mm -hmm. It's not just food, it's also education. And you have to participate in, in all aspects of the program to participate. You can't just choose one. So that was kind of the, um, the idea behind that was to give um, voice to that um, concern that came up pretty consistently in the community. So again, I, I think to remember that priority doesn't mean requirement. Okay. Um, you know, is, is, was our idea. Other discussion? Does so anybody wishes to, anybody in the public wishes to testify on, on our hunger relief strategy? I see one hand. Okay, uh, come on up. Welcome. You can just uh, give us your name, uh, affiliation if you wish, and then you have three minutes. Hi. My name is Erin Cunningham. I'm with the Boys and Girls Club of Portland. And um, I came at the end um, because I guess my testimony kind of covers many of the strategies and, and areas that, uh, that have been addressed today. And I wanted to say um, I really appreciate the, 
the work that the staff and, and the committee has put into trying to address what makes a child successful. And I think that testifying on hunger is probably at the most basic need. A child needs to know that they have food and be able to eat to be successful. Um, but I think that, that one of the issues that for me comes up as we look at all the different strategies, uh, which are great strategies, but that there's a piece uh, that some of the other people spoke to, but the whole child. Um, that is hard as I look at the different strategies and, and the programs that we do and the, the great partners that, that we work with, many of which are in the room today, is that there's, there's a piece of um, working with the entire child to have aspirations in life and be excited to learn and have the needs that they, uh, to have the food and the, the shelter and the emotional support that they need to thrive and be successful in life as adults. It's something that I hope the committee will consider as you look at how the strategies intermix together. And so that, the, that there's a, a piece that, that is about bringing the life of a child together in a holistic approach that includes academics and music and art and cycling and mentoring and that there's, that there's a I hope that there's some consideration for bringing that all together in programs that aren't necessarily siloed into this is only what they do um, or they only provide hunger relief or only mentoring. But so many of the programs that are here that have testified today do so much more than that. And I hope that as we look um, for strategies, overall strategies, that they're combined together in supporting and um, <laughs> encouraging and engaging youth to be a well-rounded adult or a well-rounded citizen. Okay. That was my testimony. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I think we are uh, completed our testimony and now we should uh, go back through each uh, proposed strategy, uh, <laughs> consider proposed amendments, and uh, then we can decide whether this needs further work or whether we're ready to vote on the strategies today. So I had, um, and you all chime in if I'm missing something, but I had the first area that we talked about was child abuse, and uh, Julie was proposing increasing the... Um, Can I interrupt, Dan? The first sure. area that you all discussed was early childhood, or okay. that was presented to you. I guess there was actually, I think, no actual discussion or amendments proposed to that strategy, or those strategies, excuse me. Okay, right. So I didn't see anybody anybody had any amendments or changes in that That's area. That's correct. Okay. So child abuse prevention intervention. Uh, Julie has an amendment to uh, increase invest up to seventy percent for uh, the category of the strategy of strengthening parenting skills and resilience, and reducing the address trauma through therapeutic intervention from up to forty percent to up to thirty percent. Did I correct. get that correctly? Okay, so that's a motion. Is there a second? I will. Uh, hold on a second. Um, do you, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, I think we need to just um, decide. It sounds to me like you all are going to decide on these today as a um, group together. And um, at least that's the way I hear you proceeding. Um, is that how you want to do it? Would you rather vote on each program area and take a, um, a motion and a second and approve each one individually, or do you want to take them as a package with sort of these amendments being discussed kind of as line item vetoes? I guess if I were thinking about it in a way that may make it easier for you all, I might suggest taking them one by one. Um, but it, it just, I, I in terms of you're... if anybody wants us to go back and revise and work on something, it would be easier to understand which one do we want to do that on, and is the other one accepted? Or not, mm -hmm. I guess. So that we can separate. Because we can put some things to bed if there if there's no discussion or further um, thoughts about it. Then if yeah. we can move forward rather than because we're only we would only bring back to you at the next meeting things that you still wanted to discuss or you wanted more work on. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm propose. I, I think we can just work through this pretty quickly here and and probably take a vote to approve all the strategies today. But is there anybody that? Wishes to have further work. Well, let's go. Let's go through this. 
Um, What's the role for you? Want, you want to vote on each, clarity, each it strategy might be helpful to as, go as, one as by we're doing one. it? Sure. Okay, yeah, let's, let's vote on the early childhood strategy then. There was, okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the early childhood strategy as is. So moved. Okay, second. second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, you got it. Early childhood. Uh, so back to child abuse prevention intervention. There is a proposed uh, change to the allocation. Um, Julie moved it. I seconded for discussion purposes. Is there any further discussion? Um, On changing it from just 70 to 30? Correct. It's 70 Correct. and 30. I would, I would just um, say again that I believe that um, child abuse is preventable. And by investing in prevention, we will be making such an opportunity for children who then hopefully will be succeeding academically, they'll be able to function, will eventually need to spend less money in all of the other areas if we can prevent maltreatment of children. Okay. And, and my point to that, I think it goes back to um, when we are doing home visiting and working with the parents up front first. I think that's part of the prevention um, is the home visiting and working with the parents. And that's one reason why I, I'd like to keep it the same um, because I think the therapeutic approach, because the mental health and is such a growing in our communities um, that is getting worse as it stands right now, um, I think there's just much more work that needs to be done in, in that area. Um, around mental health and because there's not a lot of mental health services or they're limited um, to people. And until that gets changed, I don't see that num those numbers going down in the mental health area, um, especially within Multnomah County, City of Portland. Um, a lot of these kids, there's the access just isn't there. Um, the help isn't there. Um, and it's just still a big problem that we're dealing with when we're looking at things that are going on with kids in school and after school programs, it usually goes back to mental health um, and them not getting that therapeutic intervention. And I understand about prevention. I think inter prevention is just wonderful, but I think it's also involved when you start earlier with their early childhood and the home visiting and working with the parents to get that. And I think it, it, bridges, the, it bridges that prevention with that home visiting. I think there's a bridge in there that kind of put the two together. And so that's why I would keep it 60-40. Any other discussion? OK. Uh, so we're considering uh, Julie's amendment. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nay. OK. The amendment uh, fails. Any further discussion on child abuse prevention intervention? Are we ready to take a vote on moving this strategy forward? Okay, all in favor of uh, approving the child abuse prevention intervention strategy, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, so the strategy is approved. Uh, we move next to after school, and, as I, and I have it down that Serena wanted to uh, increase. Pardon me, can I interrupt again, Dan? I think you're, the next one on the list is foster care. Oh, sorry, That's foster right. care. That's right. There was no, uh, no discussion there. So are we ready to, any further discussion on, on foster care strategy? Are we ready to move that one ahead? Okay, if we are, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Not after school. And Serena, do you want to repeat your uh, proposed amendment? My proposed amendment was changing the intensive academic support to 6070 and increasing Sun School um, to 20% from the 15%. Um, I look at the Sun School as with the, um, there's a need for kids to be somewhere after school and with the expansion of the different areas from out in East and out in North, I just think it's a, it goes along with everything else as we talk about bridging and making sure there's no gap in services for kids. I just think it all works together and it's just a smooth transition for kids to do that. And if they have the okay. after school support, it'll be there. And the academic support, they'll get that in the after school, pro in the after school and Sunday school programs. Okay, great. So the uh, 
changing intensive academic support to 60 to 70 percent of available funds and then increasing new Sun School support up to 20 percent rather than 15 percent. Is there a, that's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No? Okay. So the motion is approved. And we move on now to mentoring. And uh, Julie, I believe you had a proposal under mentoring to prioritize grades 8 through 12. Is that, is that correct? Yes, and prioritize investments that serve youth, particularly teens 8 through 12, intensive um, grades 8 through 12, intensively and have a duration of at least two years. Okay. And that's a motion? That's a motion. Okay, I'll second it. Is there further discussion? Will we keep the rest of the language all the same? Yeah. Okay. So I take it to mean to get rid of teens and say prioritize a, a get rid of the word teens and prioritize yes. grades A through 12. Yes. That's way, the way I'm hearing it. Okay. Um, discussion? So eighth, eighth grade is usually 13? Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, it's prioritized. I want to make right. clear because I feel like it's some of the testimony yet. went to that. It's not as if we would exclude programs from applying that are serving younger children. It's the, it's thinking about this population especially and assuring that we address that. Okay. Okay. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It passes. And then the last area is hunger relief and I guess... I really, I guess I should break my proposals up into two amendments. One would be to, the first amendment would be to delete the sentence that says uh, prioritizing proposals that add or include nutrition and cooking education as a program component. Um, again, I know that sounds almost un-American, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really do believe this is a brand new investment area for us and we should not be uh, being too prescriptive at this point. And I am concerned that um, this will become sort of the, the driver of the proposals rather than something that's added as a co component where necessary. So Mr. Saltzman, yes. um, would you be comfortable with a different word other than prioritize, um, like encourage proposals or some other, some other language that doesn't, um, doesn't discourage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just purely, purely hunger proposals? I guess, yeah. I mean, that's, I suppose encourage sounds a little softer to me than prioritize. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it is different. I mean, I think that we anticipate that whatever your priorities, whatever you set for your priorities, we will help run those as screens for you as you think about your investments in a program area. So we will remind you of what you set your priorities to be, and then we'll look at what you think you want to fund, and then we'll try to understand how well do they match up. So that's, you know... I think that is different. Put it this way. I think encourage is something different than prioritize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would suggest that, um, at least for me, it's the cooking education piece that's the complicated one. I think nutrition education is, um, should be inherent in, in, in the ways that we can um, help, help relieve hunger. And that partly demonstrated by, you know, according to what you're feeding the children and what you're not feeding the children. And there's a certain amount of education that could be easily... Um, reinforced as you talk about that and what they're eating. Um, I think the cooking part I, uh, I see is something that if, if we were going to pr prioritize proposals that had a cooking element over some other programs that didn't but may meet these uh, a great need, um, I wouldn't want to be I wouldn't want to be needing to make that decision. So it's the cooking the cooking part of it. Are you comfortable with the word encourage rather than prioritize? Would that deal with your concern, or um, would you rather delete the whole prioritize statement? No, I would. I would be comfortable with encourage, but I would probably again just leave it in as nutrition education rather than cooking education. Okay. So, makes it even more complicated for you. It's <laughs> a good point, though. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, I would be comfortable with encouraging uh, nutrition education and leaving out cooking education. I don't know if anybody wants to make that as a amendment. I'll make that as an amendment. I'll, I'll, I'll propose that amendment. 
So the sentence would be replaced with encourage proposals that add or include nutrition education as a program component? Yes. Okay. Okay, I would move that. There. Second. Second, okay. Discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Say aye. Aye, okay. The amendment passes, and then my last amendment was to uh, simply broaden uh, our activities, our focus on summer food activities to include the out-of-school times, uh, spring and winter breaks. So I would move that amendment. Second. Okay. Discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Then are we ready to uh, send this, uh, move, approve this strategy? I would entertain a motion to approve it. So no. moved. Okay. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, great. Made good progress. And then, uh, so we've got the strategy down. We've got the uh, allocation amongst the six investment areas settled. And then we're, our last item, which we're not really voting on today, but is to discuss proposed uh, requests for investment modifications. Uh, yes, yeah, so we wanted to just kind of run through sort of the top level changes that we were going to propose before you got um, a draft. For the, before In advance of the next meeting, we'll give you a draft of the template for the request for investment. Um, there's specific requests for investment that are drafted for each program area because there are some things that are unique to each program area. But we have, you know, constants through in terms of the, the questions that we ask um, for most of the things. So we wanted to kind of give you a preview of that, and we've put out to the public as well um, kind of a general um, uh, summary of what the changes we're going to, the major changes we're going to propose. Um, so the first is to change, to make a couple of changes to the point distribution in the application. Um, so the, in the in the application that we used in the last round of investments, um, we had two different sections, one for program description and one for um, proven program design and, and design rationale. Um, together, these were worth um, 55 points, although um, the the program description section was 25, and the proven programs was 30 points. So um, staff is going to propose that we combine those two sections um, into one, into the sort of proven program design section. Um, uh, changing, keeping the point value the same, so the, the total point value for those two questions would not change. Um, but the, the idea behind it was to try to get people not, this is really kind of a technical issue more than anything else, but to get people not to repeat their program design when they discuss their rationale, because that's what people ended up using up a lot of their space in saying, well, for this program design element, which is the following thing, this is why we have this rationale or why we designed it that way. So we're thinking, okay, this is this is wasting everybody's time, and we could fix it. So um, so that was, uh, the, des the desire there was to, to put those things together. So we're asking about, okay, what's your design element and why did you add that design element? What is your rationale for it? All in one question. Um, so that's um, that's the idea there, but it just it changes the overall format. So we want to make sure that it didn't freak anybody out and then you would understand that they, and, and we're not proposing changing the content so much as changing the way in which we ask it. Lisa, can I throw <coughs> yeah, a go question? Ahead. Sure. Um, you know, not being in the last round, uh, it looked like you had a design question and then an effectiveness question, two separate concepts, great design, poorly executed, bad results. Uh, you know, theoretically, you could have a poor design, great execution, and good results. So uh, I noticed you didn't pull the word effective forward, and it looks like it just says proven program design with no element of, but are you effective? Are you executing your strategy? Those would all be there. Um, we, we didn't really name it per se yet, and we can discuss what the name should be. So I think um, it needs to encompass all of those concepts. Um, and you'll see when we make the proposed um, draft that those questions are all there in terms of how did you design it? Um, first of all, you know, what is your design? What is your rationale for that design? So tell us, and then tell us what happened. What is your data? Um, and you know, what's your research rationale? How is what you're doing backed up by research as well as whatever data you have on the program if you've offered it before? You have to keep in mind that sometimes new programs come forward and ask for funding and they don't have um, past data. So we ask them to provide other rationale for why they think that this design is going to lead to these results. Um, so it's some people don't have every element of that based on what they're proposing. Any other questions on that before we go forward? Um, we're, when we're talking about a total of 100 points, is that correct? Total of 100 okay. points for the main application. There's some bonus points, of, and I'll get to that in a okay. second. Um, okay. But for the main program components, 100 <laughs> points. Okay. Um, the second recommendation is to make some changes to um, the other sections and the point values. Um, we'd like to reduce the um, points um, available in the organizational capacity and budget sections from 15 points apiece to 10 points apiece. And we would like to increase the point value for cultural responsiveness section from 15 to 25 points. Um, 
And the reasons for that are as follows. Um, so the first is public input. We got, um, and if you recall back to the last meeting, we were reviewing the major pieces that came out of the public input that threaded through all of the aspects of public input. Um, there were three different themes there, and one of those themes was culturally responsive and culturally specific services that integrate culture and how services are designed and provided. So that's pretty, we thought that was pretty big and, and worthy of paying attention to and, and perhaps rethinking through how we get to that result. How do we provide, how do we assure that the programs we're funding are doing that? Um, we went to our office, our city has an office for um, uh, an Office of Equity and Human Rights and consulted with them about this issue um, to try to get their feedback on here's what our old application was, here's what we used to ask, uh, do you have advice about how we go forward? Um, and they um, advised that we raise the point value for the section um, and because we should be asking more detailed and more extensive questions in this section than we had asked previously and so it should be worth more points. Um, so that, um, we took that to heart and that was part of our rationale for why we um, why we wanted to raise the point value. Um, we also took some input from the uh, Coalition of Communities of Color um, that has been in the process of drafting um, with PSU, hired PSU to help them draft a, a protocol for culturally responsive programming. Um, it's not been published yet, so I can't give that to you yet, but they gave us a draft to help us in, in thinking about how would we want to ask questions about cultural responsiveness? What kinds of things do we want to make sure we include in our asking both in this section and really throughout the RFI. Um, so we used that as well, um, and that is what bulked up this um, question to the point where we felt it needed to be worth more points. Um, and then last, um, we did look at other funders' applications, both government and private um, applications, and saw that um, many of them um, ask really fairly very little about organizational capacity and budget, um, relatively speaking to the other things that they're evaluating for the, for the types of applications that use a point system. Um, and many for organizational capacity just ask for the organization to present their mission, um, their vision, mission, and, and a strategic plan. And that's it. There are no other further questions about it at all. So we thought that on balance, those were the sections that, um, that in terms of other funders at least, people were de-emphasizing compared to us and, um, and that other people were advising that we emphasize cultural responsiveness more. Um, and as our community has, you know, increasingly, we've been around for 10 years, there's been tremendous increase in diversity over time and being able to provide culturally responsive services and to do a deep dive on whether that's happening, I think is something we need to step up to the plate on. So, um, so that's what um, we're recommending for that section in terms of points. Um, Before you go on, could I Go for it, please, in? yes, jump in I, anytime. I, I would just like to see some information, I guess just thinking through it, it seems to me that if we're, we've set priorities for populations of color, and other areas of target populations. So if a program can prove that they're effective there, and if cultural competence moves the needle, by definition, those things are redundant. So I, I have absolutely no problem with increasing cultural competency or specificity. I wonder if it should be coming out of the 55, since it's so much more related to design and effectiveness. I, I'm very concerned of, to me, uh, having only a 20% of impact on whether a program that we're going to fund is properly capitalized, properly organized. We can look forward and say this program will be around in the three years we're going to fund it. Those are really important things in terms of being stewards of the public's money. And I, I am concerned that we're devaluing kind of the foundational questions that we ask about the programs we're going to fund. And I think that's a reasonable point. Um, so, I mean, I think this is going to be ripe for more discussion. So I think it will also help you when you see a draft um, of what it actually looks like. Um, and then you'll have some idea about whether you want to, how, you'll understand better how, what kind of questions we're asking in those sections, um, what sort of changes we've made. So um, I think that's, that's, that's the point of bringing it up now is to kind of give you a, a heads up of where we're heading. And then you guys will go take it from there. Um, and you can hear testimony, if there was time today, we'll take testimony too, um, at least initial testimony. Understanding that I understand you're working in a vacuum, you don't have a draft yet, and I would have liked to have had one to offer you, but not quite there yet. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to recommend is that we would keep the bonus points. Last time um, we funded the major priorities um, for uh, that came out of public input were around funding increasing service in East Portland due to increasing poverty and diversity in that part of the city, um, and increasing um, funding for culturally specific programs. Okay, which is a specific definition in the RFI as to what constitutes a culturally specific program. Um, and the public input this time around was to keep those bonus points, don't get rid of them generally, with the exception of um, foster care program areas 
for the East Portland. Um, and that was because people in that program area basically said that's a population you're trying to serve and you should serve them wherever they are. It doesn't matter what part of the town they're in. The point is to get to them wherever they are. Um, and so um, staff thought that was sensible and that um, that should not, um, we shouldn't keep the bonus, that particular three points for that. Um, so that was our, our thinking on that. Um, we didn't see a reason <laughs> to eliminate it and, and there was support for it continuing um, to highlight those needs. Um, questions on that? Well, I guess um, one of the things I, I want to see, and I guess we will see before we approve these requests for investments, uh, you mentioned the culturally responsiveness by asking different and more detailed questions in this section. So I guess I want to see mm -hmm. what those different and more detailed questions are. <laughs> but I guess, yeah, so I'm trying to reconcile if we're increasing uh, culturally responsiveness section to 25 points, how does that interact with the bonus points for culturally specific? I mean, is that... Well, well, cultural responsiveness is something that applies to all organizations. We're expecting all organizations to be culturally responsive. Um, and so that's some, it, what we have done is sort of in trying to revise the questions that we're asking there is to up the ante on what do you have to do to be culturally responsive? What do you have to show that you do? And what kinds of policies and practices do you have in place to address that? What level of thinking have you done about it, et cetera? And what's been your results in, in addressing these issues? Um, so that's kind of the bulk up there. They're not, there's not, there is no preference in that section for culturally specific programming. Okay, it's it, the point is that every in the section that would be the twenty five points. That's that's everybody has to reply to that, and it's to show that you are culturally responsive, no matter who you are. So if you're culturally specific, we still want to understand. Some culturally specific organizations serve more than one culture, so we would want to understand that you're equally responsive to both. So there's those kinds of issues that crop up, and and the and those questions would need to be addressed by everybody. For culturally specific, that that really came through a, a different strand of input. That is, everybody needs to be culturally responsive, but we have a real need for culturally specific programming in our community and to continue to support that. You know, currently about a third of our resources in terms of dollars go into culturally specific programs. So just to give you that a sense. So the people highlighted that yes, that and more, many, we got input more culturally specific programming. So that was done to sort of uh, help or assure or give a little extra boost to um, culturally specific programming to assure that we're keeping that level of investment reasonably high. Okay, thanks. Um, any other or were, were you through or did no we okay, have a couple more through. we have a couple more big ones but go ahead take any questions you have um, I I had thought that in the past the bonus was given for serving east of 82nd Avenue I'm yes not, is that okay and that rather than East Portland well it, you can define East Portland many different ways um, we have used generally the border of 82nd Avenue okay um, there is um, the East Portland action plan group which defines it slightly differently but not, I would say, not significantly differently. Okay. Were you thinking that it was something else, or? No, I just I was noticing where it says the request for investment section that from 2009. There it says there too, serving East Portland, and I I thought that language had been east of 82nd Avenue, but apparently wasn't. Um, it was actually. I just didn't write it that way there. So right. that was just my oversight. Okay. It was always east of 82nd, and we basically looked up. We have a, a zip code list of the zip codes that fall basically east of 82nd Avenue. So we use that as a guideline because people collect zip code. People don't know necessarily where you live east, <laughs> but they know your zip code. And, and so that's the, the marker that we use for, for folks to, to understand that. And that's a, a, a piece of data that pretty much everybody collects. So it's an easy one to understand. Okay, so that's, um, that's kind of the point distribution issues that we were thinking of um, or that we will propose to change. And um, as I said, more discussion. You can hear people's input on this and, um, and go from there. Um, the other uh, shift we were going to recommend making is that we, um, again, set a goal. And by goal, I don't mean written in stone. I mean goal um, that of investing in 30% uh, of our resources in culturally specific programming in each program area. And um, the reason that staff um, had made this um, recommendation is a couple things. We, it, right now, the investment is somewhat uneven. Overall, as the fund, we have approximately 30% of our resources in culturally specific programming. But that's not 30% in every program area. And we've noted, I mean, some of you folks haven't, most of you haven't been around for very many data presentations. But typically, this time of year, we'll give you a data presentation on what has happened in the past year. And what's happened, we've noted in those presentations for several years, is that some program areas don't have a lot of investment in culturally specific programming and are not necessarily serving high numbers of kids from certain cultural groups 
in different areas. And so our goal would be to make sure we're kind of paying attention to that on the front end as we make investment. Um, and so. And, and, and in that process, hopefully encourage people, um, encourage uh, programs or agencies to apply that are culturally specific in areas where we have historically had lower investment in culturally specific programs. And that would be, in particular, mentoring and child abuse, I would say, currently are the two program areas where there's the lowest investment, the least investment in culturally specific programming. So part of the idea of having the goal would be to encourage more people to apply. Um, and we kind of we got that target that 30 percent both because that's about what we're doing currently and we also looked at the the county sun service system currently invests a third of their um, finance a third of the pool of funds they have for this overall sun service system which is larger than just the sun schools so it's a bigger system than that um, they invest a third in culturally specific programming um, we also looked to some other city departments just to see where there are other types of goals or that we could use as kind of a reference point for what percentage we didn't um, since most city departments are not contracting with nonprofits to provide service that's not you know that they're, they're they're using city employees to provide services it's not there's um, and and then they're hiring out professional type of services. It's a different, there, there wasn't anything directly com comparable. So we looked at the, um, at the what's called the NWESB goals, which is the minority, women, emerging small business. Okay, I can if I get all those there numbers right. <laughs> I have to stop and think every time. Um, what some of those goals were for different departments and other, and, and other people who had projects that where they were looking at equity and trying to under, and use and using equity and equity lens or applying an equity approach and doing their contracting. Um, and then there we saw um, an example for, from the Bureau of Planning Sustainability um, project where they included 30% um, of the, the equity goals of the project included 30% of the trade and technical hours worked completed by historically dis disadvantaged um, groups or underrepresented people. Um, and at least 20% of the funds contracted th out through this project um, were to go to businesses owned by historically disadvantaged or underrepresented people. So they're using targets somewhere in the same range um, um, for trying to get to some of the same goals. Um, and same when we looked at how the Housing Bureau's MWESB goals for development, um, they were also looking at 30% being ideal deal, 20% being a minimum um, for projects. And so again, you know, we have slightly different, that's a bigger category than culturally specific program. I'm not trying to say they're identical, because they're not. But, um, but we were looking for some kind of guidance. They were things in similar ranges. So that's sort of, we didn't pull the percentage out of the air. We tried to look at other people, what we've done and what other folks are doing in some comparable way to understand. So well, Lisa, when you provide us the information, can you also, I guess relative to my earlier question, but I, I'm just sitting here thinking about how culturally specific will interplay with our hunger program, which is basically delivering food to locations, and, and whether culturally specific overlay is going to improve the efficacy of the programs we fund or not, same with foster care or any, any of the other programs, mentoring. I mean, it seems very logical and straightforward that it would. Uh, presumably, there's some research um, or some evidence that you can include when you send it out to us for each one of our programs, why being culturally specific will improve the results. Yes, I mean, there's it, there's different things in different areas that discuss that. There's also literature that lies over all service delivery, no matter what you're doing. Um, so yes, we can certainly give you that information um, along with, and, and I think that's that's a valid question. And whether you want this to apply in all program areas is part of what you want to consider, so if whether you want to make exceptions to it or not. And Lisa, the 30% yeah. is, a, is a goal, but we could exceed that if we saw a need in the, within the mm -hmm. strategies. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there's a, a goal is a goal. And I think it, the bottom line is that you have to, in, in any given, so for instance, if in hunger, you do not see, receive a single application for culturally specific um, services. I mean, I think that would tell you that that goal was not workable. I mean, you know, that we thought that that was a worthy goal, but it, it didn't turn out to be something in the community that anybody wanted to do, or that wasn't how services were delivered in that particular program area. So, I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, you're going to be confined by reality, by what you, who comes forward and, um, and who presents applications that are persuasive to you. Um, so it's, I don't think that they can be hard and fast. And just a follow-up question, is there, um, is there intensive outreach to, um, communities of color and nonprofits that are culturally specific so that they understand everyone in our community is aware of the, the deadlines and the process to, pro to make proposals for and that that's a newbie question I, I apologize I'm not I'm not familiar with the outreach process but I, mean, I, I, would, I don't know it. if I would describe it as intensive but um, um, it's I mean we we do as much as we can to 
publicly notice that. We have an extensive database. We ask people to forward it on to whomever they think might be interested. I mean, you have to do have to keep in mind that our government, you know, accountability standards are higher than they are for many foundations. And so, um, you know, we are because we are taxpayer supported. So our you know, a lot of grassroots organizations have difficulty meeting all of those requirements. So I think that is something that is an issue that um, that outreach doesn't solve. So there's outreach, but there's also capacity mm -hmm. to be able to do the application and to be able to be accountable at the level that we ask you to. Um, so I think we do a pretty good job of outreach. I'd like to see us to be able to do better. I think um, if people have suggestions or thoughts or how we might do that, we would certainly love to hear. I would just say, since I did go to some of the meetings, the outreach meetings, I thought you all did a great job at outreach. I thought it was um, very well represented across communities of color. Um, I don't know how you could have done better. But. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> I hope that's true. Um, yeah, so, I, thought, I, mean, I thought it was an excellent job that you all did. I mean, Mary Gay does a great job, in, but short of, I wouldn't say that we're out there providing personal assistance, put it that way. You know, we do a, a great job, I think, of publicizing um, in the general sense, but we're not providing sort of personal assistance in applying. And that's the word anyway. was definitely out. The word is out. Okay, the last um, area in which we were going to propose a modification different than what we've done in the past was requiring earning minimum points um, in order to be even considered for funding um, in certain areas. And um, we came up with 39 points in the in that sort of combined section, so 39 out of 55 that you would have to have in that proven program section and your design rationale section, and then 16 points in the culturally responsive program um, area. And um, the concept behind this was to, A, set a clear standard so people understood what they were trying to meet. I think that that is just to put out there so people knew what they were aiming for. Um, and then to assure that we're investing in something that at least meets a minimum standard. Um, and I think in the past, um, you know, we have not... In terms of overall points, we have generally not funded programs that probably fell below a 70 points total, wouldn't you say? I think I'm about right. About, about, about right. Um, I could look that up to be sure. But um, um, but this was something really we were thinking about. You need to be you need to be able to show that effectiveness. You need to be able to, a sound design and effective delivery. You need to be able to show that, and there should be a minimum standard there, absolutely. And you should have a minimum standard and cultural responsiveness. If you're going to, 60 percent of the people that are served with levy dollars are folks of color. And so we need to assure that we're doing as good a job as possible in, um, in that service delivery um, to make sure that we're getting the outcomes equally across all populations. I would like to add one thing. I would like to echo what Mitch has said about the budget and, make, and being great stewards of the taxpayers' money. That I think that is really important that we might look at changing that as well. So some kind of a minimum? Yeah. I mean, we could set minimums in all sections. These two are the ones we thought were most important to have, but I'm Certainly willing to hear otherwise. Any other questions before I see if anybody wants to say anything? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Mitch, but I think you were also suggesting a higher po higher point point total for organization and. Yeah. Budget? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, again, I haven't seen, I, I want to read it all. Yeah. I may have a very different opinion once I read it all. So, okay. but it's just something yeah. that, uh, I, that I, comes I, up. I find important. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Well, this is informational today only, but we do have about five minutes left. If there's anybody that wishes to testify again, we're not voting on anything today. Okay. I see one hand raised, two hand raised. Okay. Three, okay. Come on up. We've got room for three of you. And that's really, I think, all the time we're going to have for, for testimony. So, again, we're not voting on this today, and we will have testimony uh, before we do vote. So, um, I think because of the, we're getting close to our, our closing hour, I'm going to give you each two minutes. So, if you can just give us your name and uh, affiliation, if you wish, and you each have two minutes. Sure. Uh, Mike Conway, Community Cycling Center. Under the Request for Investment Sections 2013, the first bonus points section, um, in addition to serving East Portland, I'd like to recommend serving uh, North Portland. Um, and for example, there's a community there called New Columbia Community. It has a wide uh, diversity of people and culture, 22 cultures, 18 different languages. Um, and additionally, there's a, a school there, Rosa Park School, that doesn't have a Sun Community Program. So I think the, the opportunity is ripe to develop uh, programs and funding in this area, and I would like to have organizations receive the potentially receive bonus points for um, encouraging work and in that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Hello, um, my name is Rebecca Lomboto, and I work with um, Immigrant Refugee Community Organization, ERCO. Um, we coordinate culturally specific programs um, under, er, under the early childhood, after school, and mentoring program areas through with the Portland Children's Levy. Uh, ERCO works over with over 24,000 people every year, and our program found through the levy serves more than 525 immigrant and refugees, children, and family um, living in Portland area. Um, we have a few concerns about the proposed change to the request for investment. Um, one, we would like to request a uh, defined of cultural uh, response, uh, cultural responsiveness um, that is referred to the proposed change to request for investment. And second, we have some concern that although one proposed change list in the request for investment is to invest at least 30% of funds allocated to each category in culture specific programming. Cultural specific is pulled completely um, for the scoring criteria with the exceptions of a small number of extra bonus points, um, like three points or 2% of total for culture specific programs. So. What I have to say. Okay, thank you. thank you. Good morning, Mark McKechnie from Youth Rights and Justice. Um, before we see the draft of the RFI, and I, I realize my comments may be relevant once I see it, having not seen it, but um, we, we may have the distinction, our program, of being the lowest scoring program to be funded in the last round. Um, and I just want to recommend that uh, the questions in the RFI be as open-ended as possible, understanding that we have information about what your priorities are. We struggled to respond to some of the questions in the last round because they asked for very specific information that wasn't particularly applicable or relevant to our approach and our program model, which is advocating for kids in schools. So it didn't involve regular uh, activities, classes, meetings, sessions, home visits, those kinds of things. And, and a lot of the questions seem to be asking for very specific information like that. So we spent time trying to explain why the question, why the information the question was trying to elicit wasn't relevant to our program and then trying to explain why our answer was relevant to our program. So we're trying to make uh, our answers fit the format of the questions, which was difficult in our case. And I recognize that some of the priorities have changed, so that may take care of part of the issue for us. Um, but I would just recommend that having open-ended questions has many benefits um, in terms of not suggesting the answers that you want as well, so that it really puts the onus on us to make the strongest case possible in explaining why our program should be funded. Thank you. OK, thank you all. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I'd also like to particularly thank the staff for their hard work in making this process uh, go so smoothly and transparently. Uh, our next meeting will be December, Monday, December 16th, from 1 to 3 p.m., right here in the City Council Chambers. And then we will meet on Friday, January 10th, 2014, from 2 to 4 p.m. in the City Council Chambers. Uh, you will be receiving updates and reminders from staff, as well as uh, on the levy website, which is portlandchildrenslevy.org, and or you can go to our levy Facebook page and keep keep up on things. So happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. That was, got some real work done today, I think. Yeah.